Hey, I noticed I started every video off with welcome, welcome, welcome. So I guess that's my thing. So welcome, welcome, welcome. It's Wednesday, Toe for Spin Meteorite Hangout. Hope you guys are appreciating the new art on my wall. I used to have it just blank with my logo up there. I finally got off my ass and uh, installed my prints, my meteorite prints. So I'm super happy about that. Um, nice. Yeah. And I'll, I'll show awesome. I'll show them off later. I'll get the camera going mobile, but we can also play the game. If you can name a meteorite or a classification, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll play that game later. Um, we got some fun stuff to get into today, some meteorite news to update. And, and uh, one of the great things, one of the goals of these Hangouts is it's kind of like our AA meeting for meteorite ad addicts. <laughs> we get together, we get to tell each other our stories, give our spouses or significant others a break from the monotony for a while. But also the goal is education and outreach. And that's really why I take my entire Wednesday off of commercial uh, procedures just to focus on, on outreach and education. So I'm super excited to have another outreach specialist guest with us today. Um, the last one we had was Grant Harkness. Um, and uh, the I can't remember the name of his organization. I'm very sorry. Uh, but uh, we have Christopher Colvin. So Chris Colvin, one of my friends, I actually got to meet him when I was in Minnesota. And uh, he is with an organization called SLU. So he's going to tell us all about that later on and how that, we hope, feeds the next generation of students and enthusiasts in astronomy. And that's a side subject for today, astronomy. Um, we talk about collecting meteorites, but now we're actually going to talk a little bit about what's in the sky, what's visible. And that's another great reason to have Chris here. He is an amateur astronomer. I'm going to let him tell you all his affiliations because I don't want to mess it up. Uh, he is quite uh, an accomplished individual as, as far as I'm going to call him self-taught um, street of hard knocks. He's an astrophotographer as well. So he's going to share some of his uh, photography with us and it should be a pretty good hangout. So if anyone has anything that they want to show and tell, by all means, I'll shut my yapper and highlight you. We also have a video check-in from Marco in, in Germany. He's feeling a little better, so he sent us a video. In fact, let's go ahead and roll that now. Hold on. All right. So Marco is back with us from Germany. Marco Geyser checking in. Um, guess what he has to show us this week, guys? Oriented meteorite. <laughs> An oriented meteorite. <laughs> but, but the surprise <laughs> is it's only one and it's his favorite. Hello everyone. I hope everybody's doing good and you're enjoying the hangout. Unfortunately, I was not able to send you a video last week because I was lying in bed, did not feel good, but now everything is okay. And of course, I'm uh, sending you a video. Today, I want to show you only one piece, but it's my absolutely favorite piece. So, here he comes. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> it's an extremely oriented nose cone uh, meteorite. And uh, the piece has been found about uh, 30 kilometers um, east of the Algerian town Ouagla. I hope I'm spelling it right. Um, in the first week of August this year, and um, I've seen that piece uh, on Facebook and I was absolutely amazed. Um, uh, it was a big dream of mine to own a big uh, nose cone oriented meteorite. And yeah, this one is big. It weighs about 8.19 kilos. So um, a real monster. And it's the first and only meteorite who that I gave a field name and I call this one the Cone of Wagla. <laughs> nice. So let's have a detailed look on the piece and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, let's have a detailed look on the Cone of Wagla meteorite. 
As you can see, the nose cone orientation of that piece is really extreme. Um, I think it's very interesting that the piece doesn't show any rhythmic lips. It only shows really, yeah, nice and clearly visible flow lines. As you can see here. Wow. From tip all the way. But no rhythmic lips. And that on such a great or heavy piece. Wow. Look at the flow lines here. And a very thick crust, you can see it here on that ablation of, of crust. It's really, really thick. Wow. What I'm looking at is that little thing right there. Yeah, it looks yeah. like a I, I know. I, I was thinking that has Pat written all over it. <laughs> like, what is that? Yeah, that's interesting. Would you think that's a grouping up of a larger chondrite, Pat? Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's spot on, Oz. From what I can see, it looks like a uh, a very large chondral with a uh, a void in the center. Uh, that it turns out is is uh, very very common, especially as you get to the lower grades, the less metamorphosed uh, LL threes and L threes. Um, I've got an LL 3.00 that has a small pore in pretty much the center of every chondral. But Marco is absolutely correct. This thing has no regmoglyphs whatsoever. Well, the, the flow lines, um, in a couple of the areas there are, are, uh, are fluted and I would call those regmoglyphs. Yeah, many ones, but yeah. yeah. But, but you know, nothing like the... Uh, nothing extreme. Other, other uh, cone shapes. Now, one of, one of the things is that it's missing some of the, the skirt, and there may be, um, you know, it may be that there were some regmoglyphs further out on the skirt. Let's see what it is. It's a beautiful stone, though. Especially on that side, you can see nice flow lines here. Yeah, mini flutes, yeah. <laughs> Flowing from the top to the edge here. And that's the trailing side of the piece. Ooh, nice. As you can oh. see, there are some parts broken off the piece. Did you guys think it was going to be that complete? No, it didn't. It's very odd. Sometimes people represent a broken corner as an oriented meteorite. <sighs> yeah. And it's, it's done quite That's often. That's what I just said earlier. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of I heard you, and I and I, I I've seen the video before, so I knew we'd get to this. But I wanted to get your you guys' opinions. When you first saw the piece, it looked like a broken off corner of a much larger chondrite. And that secondary crest right there, it looks like. Yeah, when you look at it this way, though, you can definitely see that we are talking about a not an eight kilogram oriented piece that's nearly complete. I mean this. I don't know if my cursor is showing or not, but this is the, yes. the edge. Yep. Yeah. I didn't think it was that complete. And especially the trading side looks more weathered than the front side of the piece. So my theory is that the piece landed exactly in the flight direction into the sand. So the trading side of the piece was exponated to the air, to the desert environment and the front side of the piece was lying in ground oh and had preserved I'm, I'm looking at Ozman right now. Thank you. Yeah, the piece, as I told you, was found about 30 kilometers uh, east of uh, Wagla, an Algerian town in the Sahara Desert. Unfortunately, I don't have any in situ photos. 
That would be so cool to have them, but uh, yeah, not available. I've looked so long for such a piece, and yeah, this summer a uh, really dream came true. It was very interesting because the piece did a long, long journey, first from space here through Earth, then it was found in Algeria, shipped to Mauritania, then by plane to the Ivory Coast, from the Ivory Coast to Nigeria, from Nigeria to Belgium, and then from Belgium to Germany. <laughs> Okay guys, that was the piece that I wanted to show today. Here again, the Cone of Wagla. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And of course, I wish you a great hangout, have fun, and see you next week. Bye bye guys. That's awesome. Thank you very much for sharing each and every week. We really appreciate it, man. That's super cool. I, I love his check-ins. <clears throat> Nice. And uh, I actually have something that I can share that's quite humorous. And uh, and then we'll, I'll show this quick video and then we'll go right into Chris because uh, we'll do some show and tell afterwards. But just to lighten the mood, get everyone in a funny mood. Uh, my wife does these uh, funny videos with fellow MedHead friends of mine. And this is the, uh, it's the four weeks of Christmas. So this is the second um, release um, and this one the main character is Marco so hopefully we'll enjoy this hold on a second all right so here we go with a little bit of humor leading into the holidays Thank you, Sue, for making that for us. We appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll post that on Facebook later on tonight, guys. But so that, that got us in the in the childish mood, I hope. And uh, right now, I want to introduce actually a, a, a friend of mine. I, I can I can definitely call him a friend of mine. Not only in the virtual world, but we've actually met in person. One of one of the few, not one of the few, but one uh, one of the many people I've met. But this was an early on meet. I actually traveled to Minnesota for my real job, and I uh, had a few hours to kill. So I met up with a few of my Met friends, and uh, Chris Colvin is one of them. So. Chris, I'm going to go ahead and highlight you now. Cool. Uh, there Appreciate we go. You get the right this one. is my man, Chris. We're very fortunate to have you join us today. And uh, I want to—I just want to start with maybe a little introduction of who you are, what, you, what you're doing, uh, what your background is. I mean, there's a million questions we have for you, <laughs> and we want to—we want to date you. <laughs> uh, all right no, yeah so um and then uh, then i want to get into obviously your your passions are astronomy and um let me go ahead and join you on screen hold on and there we go so and i know your, your passions are astronomy and uh and astrophotography but you've recently taken a position that allows you to share this with young people and encourage the next generation so the floor is all yours. Take it away, buddy. There's no time limit here. <laughs> all right. Cool. Well, thanks for that awesome introduction. I really appreciate it. And forgive me, I'm going to be looking all over the place. I've got multiple screens here for you guys tonight. Um, but again, I appreciate the introduction. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Chris Colvin, and I am an amateur astronomer. I've got, I've been collecting meteorites since 2015. Um, pretty much earlier, like Topher had mentioned, uh, I'm mostly self-taught, I guess. So I'm currently working on a degree in astronomy um, from, I'm probably going to be tra transferring to Arizona State here shortly. Um, so that'll be really cool. Um, but anyway, so with that being said, I just kind of wanted to, you know, 
just kind of share some astronomy knowledge tonight with everybody kind of bring a little bit of uh you know a little a little bit of a different uh feel to the the kind of hangout here so we're always talking know. about them once they're in our hands but you know they're out there forever <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it, and it's totally fine um and it's it's really cool because so the fact that i mean i like to talk so I like to talk about astronomy even more. <laughs> and so in general, anybody, the reason why I like it is that anybody can get involved, anybody at all. So you don't need to have some super expensive telescope. You don't need to have some super ridiculous gear. You don't need to be rich. You don't need to be anything. Like you can have a pair of binoculars you got from Walmart, go outside, look up at the sky and just explore. Because even those, even that pair of binoculars will show you so much more um, then, you know, your naked eye will. So I just kind of wanted to go, I'm going to start off tonight by showing, uh, one of my favorite constellations. So this, uh, program is called Aladdin. Uh, I'm going to see here. I just got really bright on that side. Let me see if I can share this screen here. And you have, if you ever need me to pause recording, I definitely can. Cool. I think we should be up. Do we oh, see, yeah. uh, awesome. We're good. So, how many people that are here tonight are fairly familiar with the night sky or tell me, or can you tell me something in this image that just pops out at you right away? Is Orion the hunter? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Orion so, Nebula too. Yeah, so, and that's what's really cool about this program is that, uh, I'll, I'll show it to you here in a second. So for those of us who aren't familiar with it, the o Orion the hunter, the constellation is all right here. So you have the upper left armpit and this is Betelgeuse so you can actually click on it and just hover and it'll actually tell you so this is actually Alpha Orionis so that's its actual name instead of the the given name that we do or that a lot, a lot of people use so with any a star in this image essentially you can just click on it and hover over it but I'm just going to keep that over there for a second so what you can't see at night with Orion the Hunter is going to be this area right along in here if you just kind of follow the track of my mouse. This is called Barnard's Loop, and it's just a bunch of nebulous gas. So I'm going to go ahead here and zoom in. So the cool thing about this program is that as you zoom in, you get a better resolution image of what you're looking at. Even better about this program is that it is absolutely free. So there is nothing that is keeping this out of anybody's hands. So I don't know how many, so I know a lot of people recognized the constellation itself. So now we're looking at the three stars in the middle that a lot of people refer to as the belt. Mm -hmm. uh, so in here, Topher had already mentioned a second ago, the Orion Nebula. Mm -hmm. Now there are going to be many, many, much better images of the nebula because it's completely blown out uh, right now due to the exposures. Uh, and just up here uh, is going to be the Running Man Nebula. So you have the actual Orion Nebula and then the Running Man up here by itself. Mm -hmm. So we'll just go ahead and back out a little bit. And I think I may have started on it, but does anything else around this region of the sky look like kind of pop out to you? Is, what's that? The Pleiades? So the Pleiades are not quite in this area yet. We will hop on over to them in a little bit. But one that it I the one like thing I want to really looks what's like that? at ten o'clock. There's some kind of yeah, like a cat's eye nebula or something looking there. I think that might be the. I don't remember which nebula. I want to say that's either the no, that's not the rosette. That might be the witch's nebula. But so and again, you can click on it and let's see what this does. I haven't actually clicked on this in a while, but we can pull it up and this actually goes into all of the, uh, you know, a lot of scientific data. So this isn't just like a pretty, oh, it is the, ro okay, that is the rosette. Um, so tells you right there, that's the ionizing, it's an ionized cluster um, and all that. So we're not really going to dig into this tonight just because I, I'm trying to keep this as bare bones as possible. And I want people to, you know, just enjoy some, uh, some pretty pictures, but yeah. So in that, that you got to see there, um, you can click on anything like that. It'll take you straight to Sinbad and you can look at that. But one of my favorite objects ever is going to be the Horsehead Nebula and then oh. the Flamehead Nebula right here. So mm -hmm. if you zoom in close enough. Oh my gosh. 
you actually have the horse head nebula in there as well. So you guys can probably see why it's called the horse head nebula because <laughs> it literally looks like there's a horse's head just sitting there. So it's really, really interesting to see, uh, you know, something like that. And then if we just go up and over a little bit to the flame, you have this guy right here. So on, on an actual observing night with this kind of stuff, I mean, you can spend hours and hours and hours in the constellation of Orion alone. Mm -hmm. um, and so with a regular telescope, you can absolutely see like something that I was mentioning earlier. Even with binoculars, you can see the Orion Nebula. You can definitely see the nebulosity there. So uh, the one that becomes a little bit more difficult and requires an astrophotography setup uh, is going to be things like the horse head. Uh, it is very, very red. Um, so even in some cases, you might need an astro modified DSLR, which you actually take, well, you don't do it unless you're experienced, but you can pay somebody to remove the um, IR filter in there. And you can actually put uh, a filter in there that upgrades what's, or it doesn't upgrade, but it allows more red light through because it's a very hydrogen alpha um, rich spectrum. So without getting into the science, it's just a very, very narrow band of red light. Uh, that, that you're looking at in there. So too far out. So yeah, and this is, so this is all DSS. So this is the deep sky survey. And it, I mean, you can see that the entire sky has been, I mean, you can even see the large and small Magellanic clouds down here, which you can only see from the Southern hemisphere. But we're gonna stick up in this area. So if we move on over this way, you have the constellation of Taurus. And then we're gonna we're gonna have to zoom in on this guy because this is incredible. Is, I, is Taurus also known as Hyades? Yes, that's correct. Okay, that's what I've always called it. So I was like, please don't be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I mean, you could always edit that out, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the Pleiades star cluster is absolutely incredible. So it's by the naked eye, you can actually see up to seven of the stars depending on your um, depending on your on your vision. So I've heard stories and I've heard it in a few different places, so it's probably fairly accurate. Um, but back in the day, back in ancient times, it's actually said that they would pick their archers for their by, for their armies by being able to, they would take their soldiers out and have them look at the Pleiades star cluster. And if they could see all seven stars, all seven, they're called the seven sisters as well. Mm -hmm. And if they could see all seven of them, they, they would make them an archer. So there's really, I mean, nowadays, and, and like I said, it depends on your, you know, your own vision. Uh, it depends on any number of things, uh, you know, where you're located. You know, if you're, you know, where Topher, where you're at in Arizona. Yeah. It's, you know. I'm, I'm right behind a, ho uh, a hospital and there's a helipad. So there's so much light pollution. Yeah. All right. So never mind. If you're in darker <laughs> areas of Arizona, <laughs> uh, some of the best dark sky sites are down there in the entire country. So um, it's really, think... really cool. I think one thing that's really interesting that you, if you can zoom out for one second, because remember we, we, we prepared for this all of about 15 minutes yesterday on a phone call, but I mentioned uh, Orion, Hyades and Pallades. And that is just my favorite part of the sky. It is so easy to identify. And I think anyone who walks outside can see Orion. It points right to Hyades and right to Pallades, all right in a row. Yep, absolutely. and you literally see the the I it looks like a mouth of a Pac Man or a V for Hyades, and mm -hmm. then exactly, and then the Pallades is uh, actually really bright, and yeah, I can I can actually see eight stars. So, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> aren't you special? <laughs> So, and the other really interesting thing too, and, and Topher brought up and the, the mythology of this, of the stars is really interesting as well. So as you know, Orion is a hunter and Taurus is a bull. So part of the story as these were being created was that Orion, the hunter was hunting the bull in the sky mm -hmm. and chasing the bull, excuse me, across the sky as the seasons progressed. So, I'm going to go ahead and close up on this object right here, just with this program. And this is going to be the Andromeda galaxy. Wow. 
Wow. So this is going to be the closest galaxy that we have to the Milky Way. Uh, I want to say it's something like 255 million light years away, somewhere like something in those. And how so, many billion stars in that galaxy? Yep. I actually haven't tried getting as close as this before, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's really cool. And just in the last few years, too, and the last, I think even the last couple of years, um, you can actually notice and, like, we've actually mapped out um, the stars and nebulae and um, different star clusters inside of Andromeda as well. So we're not just, you know, because when you're back here, you know, you're looking at, you know, stars that are in our galaxy. Mm -hmm. But everything in here these to anybody or anything that may or may not live in the Andromeda galaxy would look like these stars and we would look like this, which I That's think is crazy. absolutely incredible to think about. That and, is crazy. Yeah. So, Space and is very large. You, what's that? Space is very large. Absolutely. And especially when you consider the fact too, that I mean, you're looking at also, you're looking at three galaxies in this image. You're looking at the Andromeda then you're looking at the two satellite galaxies as well. One here and one right here. Amazing. So that's just in that area alone. So to show my move. ignorance, Chris, because there's no, there's no egos here at all. Um, you said when you zoom in there, is the Andromeda galaxy in front of those stars that we're seeing or behind those stars? It's going to be behind them. So because... Okay. The, the stars that are in our Milky Way, so when once you leave the Milky Way itself, like let's say we could eventually go fast enough and start traveling to the Andromeda Galaxy, you are in an intergalactic space. So you're just floating between islands of stars, essentially, is, wow. is how some people look at it. So Because every star that you see, like I mentioned, in this image... You know, except for smaller galaxies that may represent some of these points of light or some of these points of light that may represent the galaxies. Um, yeah, I mean, all these stars are within our Milky Way alone. That's mind-numbing. Yeah. Because <laughs> you know how big that galaxy is, then you realize it's way, way back there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, it's way outside of that. I mean, it's way outside of what we can see as i mean we can see it obviously but it's way outside of what like what stars that are are visible to us yeah thanks for not laughing at my question no no stupid <laughs> question uh i've heard that the points of light we see in the sky at night may no longer exist that light has been traveling for eons to get to us and that star or planet or planetoid whatever may no longer exist yeah, then that's actually, like, it can be true in some cases. Um, so there's something called a light year. And, you know, a lot of people are familiar with that term because, you know, some people are like, oh, it's, you know, it's light years away or, you know, that's how we determine, generally speaking, we also use a, uh, a measurement called parsecs as well in astronomy. Um, but yes, so when I say, you know, let's just use the... Proxima Centauri. Let's just use that since it's, it's going to be the closest one to us. It's somewhere around four and a half light years away. So when I say four and a half light years, imagine if you could sit on a beam of light. So you launch a beam of light and you sit on it for four and a half years going the speed of light in a perfect vacuum, you know, and, and we've learned over time that space in all areas is not a perfect vacuum. But with that being said, uh, so, you know, the speed of light, 180,000 kilometers per second, give or take, um, going that fast, it would take you four and a half years to get to the closest star. Cool, cool. So even our own sun, our own sun, you're looking at, it takes eight minutes for the light from the sun to get to earth. So when, whenever you're looking, don't look at the sun. I just have to say it. Don't look directly <laughs> at the sun without, without proper filtration. <laughs> Um, please, I highly advise against that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it, it takes eight and a half minutes from for the sun. So if the sun ever exploded, we wouldn't know for eight and a half minutes. Like we wouldn't feel that we wouldn't know about the shockwave. We wouldn't know about 
any of that for eight and a half minutes, which is incredible when you think about it. Yeah. And then so, we know for about a split a half second and then that's it. <laughs> yep, exactly. So the good news is though, is that our sun, our sun will only ever expand and burn us to a crisp and eventually engulf our orbit. It won't explode. Oh, good. <laughs> so, so we got that going for us. Yeah, we got another four billion years. Another another four billion years. So if any of you guys are around, let me know. I want to know your secret. Um, because I probably won't be here. So the other really interesting part to all of this too is that um, you know, again, so not just four and a half light years, but if you think about a, a quasar, so something like three a quasar three C two seven C. That's going to be, I want to say, the closest quasar to us, and that's over 10 billion light years away. Oh, my God. So just if you just want to think about that for a second, 10 yeah, billion I light years. So, <laughs> yeah, so if you could sit on a beam of light for 10 billion, if you could sit on it, would take you 10 billion years going the speed of light to get to you. So mm -hmm. space is literally a way to look into the past. Mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely incredible and mind-blowing when you think about it. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over here real quick to another thing that I wanted to share with you guys. You are an amateur astronomer. You you do uh, some reporting to uh, to NASA, you were saying yesterday. I don't want to misquote you. No, you're good. So I actually, a long time ago, I shouldn't even say a long time ago. Um, so probably... I haven't been, I haven't done any asteroid reporting uh, to the Minor Planet Center probably in the last year and a half, but uh, that is a much more complicated um, aspect of, let me, okay, I thought I didn't share my screen. I'm like, this is just sitting on the screen. That's weird. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I used to, I don't right now just because it's very time consuming. Uh, gathering the data from your own telescope or online web-based telescopes can be fairly time consuming. Uh, and then plotting all the orbits and making sure you're submitting quality data because otherwise, you know, your data doesn't do any good to anybody. So when you submit a measurement, you know, for an asteroid or something, um, like, for example, 2008 TC3, some of you may know of uh, Almohada Sitta, I think is how you say it. Um, I think that, I think it's Station 3 in Arabic or something along those lines. But um so that was the first asteroid that was tracked from space to the ground and then recovered as a meteorite. So it's it's really cool to know. I actually used to have a piece of that in my collection, but a good opportunity came came along and it is no longer with me. I parted ways. Um, yeah, thanks for that, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's really cool. And it there are so many different things. So luckily for us, there are most asteroids are not going to ever come in contact with earth um but they are out there and as we've seen as recently as december 2nd we just had a massive fireball and explosion over new york um and i'll talk about that here in a little bit as well uh for those of you here tonight uh that may have been following along uh on some of my recent posts um I am going to be giving a course on using weather radar uh, to try to determine the fall location of meteorites. So um, I'm also a meteorologist for the Air National Guard. Um, so normally I use, me <laughs> I use weather radar for weather reasons. I know it's hard to believe, um, but you can actually use it. And if you know how to interrogate the data properly, you can actually use it to figure out when there's weird things like rocks in the sky. So um, that's something I love, really... I love how aggressive you are with your research. You interrogate the data. That's what it's called, radar interrogation. That's, dude, that's, that's hardcore. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> somebody's got to do it. And uh, no, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's so cool, though. And, the, you know, and the good news is, again, and I, I like to try to show people that this stuff is free. Like most... You know, I buy telescopes aren't free. If you find a free telescope, let me know because I want it. I have four. I have a problem. I know. Um, but if there are so many resources out there that are either free or affordable or, you know, there are people and again, I'll kind of get into this in a little bit as well. But there are people out there uh, and organizations out there that are dedicated to, you know, essentially getting kids into astronomy and space and stuff like that. So. Uh, one thing I wanted to share with you guys, this is actually really one of my favorite, um, let me see if I share screen again. 
There it is. So this is what is called Planet Hunters on a uh, website called Zooniverse. So Zooniverse is actually really cool because as a whole, again, anybody who's interested in any project like this, you can just show up to the website, sign up, and they'll put you through tutorials. So I would have just given you guys an example uh, to show you what we were what we're looking at essentially here. So um, there is no current data. We're actually waiting on the new sector to be downloaded because, and the reason why people need to do this and not computers is because, so what you're looking at here is a light curve of a star over a period of about 27 days. So what this does, the, the test satellite, the Transiting Exoplanet Sky Survey, I think it's something along those lines or close, uh, it goes through and it takes images of these stars and it measures the brightness of them. So here we can see, didn't mean to click on that, but we can see how it gets brighter than more faint, brighter than more faint. So you can get into, you know, the science of it, or you can just go through and click and say, hey, look, there's, you know, a potential exoplanet here, a potential exoplanet here. Most of the time you're going to be looking at variable stars. So, and variable stars themselves are extremely interesting. It's one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite topics, especially young stellar objects where you can actually see protoplanetary disks around the stars. So solar systems forming before our eyes. Uh, again, those solar systems are either completely formed or they are in the process of forming. But um, again, in our lifetime, we're not ever going to see it come to completion more than likely. Uh, and even more recently, one of my favorite things that I've seen that I don't have actually queued up tonight is, um, is a star system that we're actually watching planets over the last five years uh, actually being ripped apart by its host star, completely obliterated, like destroyed, disintegrated into dust. So simple things like this, anybody can get into and, you know, you can just go on, do the tutorial and you're doing real science that actually matters because computers, unfortunately, they can get you close to what, you know, a transit may look like, but AI is not to the point where, you know, it, it can determine, you know, this, but, uh, you know, in my opinion, you know, so this person down here is asking if it's a, an eclipsing binary, which are two stars essentially at orbit around each other, and it causes variations in brightness due to one star being brighter than the other. So lots of really interesting things that you can see here. So next up, shameless plug for myself. Um, you can see I have a whopping eight subscribers on here, guys. So I'm going to um, put all the links to everything you're talking about uh, is going to be in, in the uh, comments below. So um, awesome. Yeah. So no, no need for everyone to write right now. It's, it'll all be in the comments. Cool. Thanks, Topher. But yeah, so then this is my, my own podcast that I do on my own. Um, as you can see that, uh, there's only three episodes and I've been very busy. I'm, I'm very, very intent on getting these, uh, getting these back up and running. Um, so space bites, the podcast is essentially about, I want to say bringing earth, space down to earth for everyday people, but it's a total ripoff of the everyday astronaut and I love him. So, um, I can't do that, but my goal is just to bring space and not rockets and not, you know, stuff like that, because there are plenty of people, like I mentioned, you know, the everyday astronaut and these other guys who, you know, cover that stuff very well. What I think is missing out there is, you know, good entry level material um, for people who want to get into astronomy as a whole. So if you guys want to head on over to that channel ever and just give me a, give me a subscription, I would very much appreciate it. Yeah, I'll that. tell you what, that's everyone's homework right now is subscribe and like to this one, then go over into the comments, link over to him, subscribe. And one of the goals, I, I don't mean to jump in here, Chris, but I'm going to jump. No, you're good. Um, one, one of the goals with partnering with Chris is to – he, we're deep diving right now into some of his capabilities, what he what he does, the intricacies, the science behind it. But he's going to get into um, the organization that he's working with uh, and uh, SLU. And what we're trying to do is bring astronomy down to kids or 
kid like people like me <laughs> who have no knowledge of this yet and open up the sky. So when you walk outside at night, you're not walking and looking at the sidewalk. You're mm -hmm. tripping over things by looking up and being in awe of the universe. So one of the things that I'm hoping to do, and it'll try to hopefully help Chris keep his schedule on his podcast as well, is monthly check-ins. What's in the sky this month? Because um, I know of two things right now, Chris, that happened this month that any one could have witnessed or can witness on the 21st, right? Absolutely. Why don't you highlight those a little bit and then go into whatever you want to talk about? Sure. So the one that jumps to mind immediately is going to be, man, anytime, anytime this happens, it pops up a message on my camera over here. I'm like, no. <laughs> um, so the, the Gemnids meteor shower actually every year, uh, December 13th to 14th. And, I know there have been some people extremely lucky this year from the meteorite community who've been able to uh, to witness some. Yeah. So it's so cool to be able to see. It's actually the best meteor shower of the entire year. So uh, upwards of 150 per hour is not unheard of. Um, so there is just, it's amazing. So Topher, I want to know what the second thing is. Well, the, the first one was the Gemini meteor showers. Okay. It was easy to spot because it's right next to Orion. And due to the sheer numbers of them, you're more apt to see one. I, I saw eight, including one that was spectacular. I, I'd love to draw it out because it was really weird. It, it literally had two lines going after it. It was really wild. But the second thing I was talking about is the... Oh, Saturn, Jupiter. Ah, uh, yes. Ah. On the 21st. I'm trying not to get my hopes up because it's going to be cloudy. Uh, <laughs> I, I guarantee it. Every time. Like, the Gemnids are on my birthday every year, and I got clouded out this year for the fifth year in a row. So, um, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, but, yeah, so that conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn, uh, there has actually been some misinformation out there on that. So a lot of people are being told that it happens once every 800 years, uh, when in fact it happens about once every 20 years. So really, the, yeah. So that's the that's the media just trying to sensationalize uh, a lot of different things. So um, essentially, it happens every 20 years, but this is going to be the closest they've been in hundreds of years. So a conjunction absolutely happens every 20, but you're not, you know you can see this roughly again in 20 years from now. Okay. So yeah, it's, <laughs> it's really cool. I'm very excited, but just based on, you know, years of meteorological data up here in Minnesota, um, my, you can pretty I, much <laughs> foretell I, that that's one of the bad things about astronomy versus meteoritics. I would imagine is meteoritics when it's rainy, I can come inside. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And for me, luckily, I guess, I mean, as long as it's not just cloudy, clouds are boring weather. Um, they're pretty sometimes, I guess. But, uh, you know, if there's, if it's bad enough to where I can't get my telescopes out, I'm probably looking at radar or some sort of, you know, satellite imagery just because it's fun. Uh, I was trying to find it for us tonight. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I couldn't, but I was actually able to uh, that last year, that solar eclipse over the Pacific Ocean, there was a hurricane and you could actually see the shadow of the moon go across the ocean in the GOES-16 imagery for GOES-17 imagery. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. It was, it would have been awesome. Well, so I, I, I do want to, like I said, I do want to have you back monthly for, for check-ins for what we can look for in the sky and just your, just your insight in general. Um, I do want to make us, it's a small announcement. It's, it's more of a, a, a gesture, if you will. Um, I want to, I want to make sure that we spend time on SLU. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a organization that I just learned about and I honestly did more research on it today. Um, and after doing that research, um, the GoFundMe that we that you've set up, you're going to describe all of it, what it's about. But the the amount that we're, that we you the, the the global we are looking to raise is twelve hundred and fifty dollars. 
And uh, on behalf of Topher Spin Meteorites, I'm telling you, if you get to 1150, I will put in the last hundred dollars. Awesome. So, I appreciate that. So hopefully we can. Uh, and and again, um, let me hit pause one second. Yeah, so there will be an official GoFundMe page set up, um, but as always, uh, and the link will be in, in down below. Um, as always, though, if you are a friend of us uh, and you feel comfortable reaching out to either myself or Chris, our contact information is below. We can take the donation on behalf of the GoFundMe page and kind of keep 100% of it for the organization and not really give GoFundMe a cut. So don't know if that's uh, ethically right to say, but it's my show and I said it, so deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris, why don't, you, uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about SLU, what the, what the funds are for, what the goal is, and, and what the organization and, and your position, their uh, goal are. Absolutely. So right now I actually am a part-time educational astronomer and there's that little notification again um, with them. So what we're doing right now, or at least what I'm doing is there because of COVID-19 and sorry, I don't know if that demonetizes your videos. If you get any cut from this, Topher, I apologize. I don't, I don't make any money off this crap. I do it for love. Cool. <laughs> so the good news is, is that, you know, there you a lot of schools, you know, they're, they're playing it safe, but without getting into, you know, the whole politics of this, uh, unfortunately, you know, kids are missing out on a lot of education opportunities that they would have if they're in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So what SLU is doing right now is they are actually partnering with schools to bring their services to the, the students who are either are distance learning or even in class still. So what is happening on, on that side of things is because there is a lack of funding in schools already. Got a frog, frog in my throat. <clears throat> Sorry. No um, so because there is a lack of funding in schools already, there's even more so of a lack of funding available right now because of the constant back and forth and new programs and new things that are having to be made. So um, part of my job is to figure out different uh, sources of funding and to help some of these kids uh, who wouldn't have access to this because of whatever, you know, reasons, whether it's sociopolitical, socioeconomic, um, who normally wouldn't have access to telescopes that they're getting them. And if the schools can't afford them, um, you know, I'm in the process of trying to figure out grant writing and reaching out to different nonprofits to donate. So the $1,250, it sounds like a lot, but the good news is, is that for SLU right now, they're running um, a program where you can get it down to, well, it's normally $50 for a student account, but with the way I'm running it right now, um, we, you're able to donate $25 or donate whatever you can, but $25 gets this program into a student's hands for an entire year. So that doesn't give part them about a, that doesn't give them a telescope that gives them right. access to even yes, better so telescopes than they could buy. Yes, 1000% true. And both in the Northern and Southern hemisphere, which is extremely beneficial because not only do you, you get to essentially you're, you're globalizing what you can learn. So, I mean, we have telescopes down in Chile and then uh, some in the Canary Islands, um, which is really cool because again, you have some in the Northern hemisphere, you can see Northern hemisphere targets and Southern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere targets. So the other really unique, uh, and you're not just giving access to a telescope either. You're actually making sure that they, you, you know, you learn history, reading comprehension, all these other things that, you know, are essentially overlooked uh, right now. And the, the unique aspect of SLU is that you get to learn about the astronomers, you know, that, you know, centuries ago made contributions to science. Nice. So you get to learn about the, the historical aspect. And let me go ahead and let me share my screen again. Let me see if this shares the whole, I can't tell if this is sharing. There we go. Okay. So I can't. I, I couldn't see. imagine if I was a kid and I had any interest in astronomy whatsoever and I had something dumped in my lap or by the way, here's this whole program project and it's professionally run. Like it would have been, 
an absolute dream. Yeah, absolutely. And the cool part here is that, you know, so all these things here, these are all called quests. So all these quests are run. And the amazing part is, is that the teachers or parents who are involved, uh, they don't need to know one thing about astronomy. They don't need to know anything about, astro you know, a telescope, about, you know, astronomical history or historical figures. That's what these quests do. So let's just, I'm just going to click on one of these for just to show you guys exactly what we're looking at here. So what this does is, you know, these gravity points, this allows you to level up. And when I say level up, you learn, uh, you know, you're an astronomer and every level you, you know, increase, you learn about a new astronomer that you become, like that's the level mm. you're promoted to. So it tells you right here how long it'll take. So you can do this in one season. You get 300 points, and then this is a fairly difficult challenge. So this goes over the life and death of stars. So if you wanted to, you can click Start Quest. And then what's going to happen is this, as this loads up, um, so we can read more. So it gives all of this, all pre-guided, um, essentially, material and you go through it and you gather observations. So with these telescopes, you can actually go through and take images of all of these different things. And at the very end, you can, so in, in some of these, you're gonna be answering questions. So that's kind of where your reading comprehension comes into play. And then at the very end, you get to claim your badge. You get to display in your profile as like a trophy for, for completing <laughs> the quest. And then for the, again, for the educational side of things, uh, you can download the quest report that'll tell you, that'll tell your teacher or whoever, like, hey, we're done, or I did this. So let's go ahead and see. All right, wow. All right, so the good news is, is that it's nice down in uh, Chile tonight, not so much in the mm -hmm. Canary Islands. And the other thing I want to bring up, too, is that there is also a solar telescope as well, which is really cool. Oh, wait, wire. Okay, apparently it's good enough for Canary 4. So maybe there's just a, an issue with 1, 2, and 3 tonight. Uh, so let's just go to uh, Chile 1. So you can actually... Telescopes are now aimed to the far southerly Oh, I guess that is... Where is the mute button? All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and back out of that because that's a guided tour. And again, I guess that's kind of a cool thing. Um, but not really what I'm trying to show you tonight. But you can actually click on to these and go live into the telescope what somebody else is looking at. So you don't even have to um, you don't even have to be like booking the missions yourself. So you, you can quote unquote piggyback and look at other people's images as they're looking at them in real time. And in real time, you know, you're gonna, as you just saw a second ago, they can be a little um, a little grainy, a little blurry, but after the post processing that SLU does and any post processing that you want to do yourself, you can actually make some incredibly stunning images. Um, out of these, um, out of this da telescope data. Let me see if there's anything. Chris, can you actually link to the Hubble telescope? No, nope, not to Hubble, unfortunately. Oh. I wish we could, that'd be incredible. <laughs> so let me see. So these are some of the ones that I've been using uh, recently. So these are some of my images. Uh, let's see if we can, why is this not doing it? So in this area of the sky, I'm actually just, this is literally what science is. It's not always pretty, but you're looking at areas of the sky. And then what I can do with uh, the program I showed you earlier, actually, uh, Aladdin, you can take another image of the same part of the sky, line them up, and then blink them back and forth. So what you're seeing is anything that may appear in the image that wasn't there before. It's either going to be an asteroid, mm -hmm. it's going to be... Um, hopefully not an airplane, a satellite, which will just look like a giant streak across your screen. And in some mm -hmm. cases, a, a nova or a super uh, supernovae. So it would be... Too much space junk. What's that? Too much space junk around. Well, I mean, you can see right now in this image that there's really no space junk. And luckily, um, you know, there's there's a lot of really... You know, yeah, I mean, and I and I can't deny, yes, there is plenty of junk in space, but I'd say pretty rarely does it interfere with images. And if you know how to do it and it's not being sensationalized to try to make uh, certain companies look bad, uh, mm -hmm. you can absolutely remove star trails from, from astrophotographs. So, 
Yeah. Really nice. And then, so this is just an example of something that somebody could put together with SLU data. So um, this is, what was it called? The Frisbee Galaxy. So, I mean, here, here's, here's what you're looking at. And this is exactly what these telescopes are capable of. So on top of all the learning, on top of all the telescopes, uh, all of the quests and everything you see on here, um, you know, $25 for an entire year for a student. And they can choose to go through any of the, any of these quests. They can choose to go through and in any order the teacher can say, Hey, let's do this for the night and, you know, and go through there. So. It's, this is, so this is fantastic. almost like, um, it looks like an Xbox game. That's, and that's exactly <laughs> what we, that's exactly what, you know, we say is that it's the, it's the gamification of space. Yeah. Because, you know, you're able to go through and, you know, look at this and look at all these different things. So uh, mm -hmm. this club, so you can have private clubs or public clubs. They're actually going to be, their name is changing to work groups here pretty soon. I hope I was allowed to say that. Um, so it's actually really cool because with this, you can actually uh, either create your own or, so this is the group right here I had mentioned earlier that uh, I have tracked and reported um, yeah, asteroid yeah. positions. Yeah. The A-team, and it's like a ha, -ha asteroid team, A-team, honey um and then this over here is my personal group that i started back in february and you can actually use these telescopes uh in conjunction with the aavso um to report brightness uh the brightness like the the magnitude or the variability of variable stars and then follow up on nova and supernova uh events in in and outside of the milky way mm. so it's truly an incredible an incredible service that you know they can provide and you know yeah it's you know it's a business but like i was saying right now the reason why i'm exploring different um you know areas of funding because you know schools can't afford 25 bucks a student so right now in um in gofundme we've raised 125 dollars so that'll put five students through this program for free for an entire year and it you know or for and just because it's part of the school year they can actually renew that membership and they it's you know we and SLU allows them to just use it over the summer as well so uh and they can use it at school they can use it at home wherever you want you can log in and it's a student account and the best part about this is that uh it's completely safe so if any students are on uh, they cannot communicate with people in, you know, in the chat boxes. It's all very secure. Um, they can't, they can only participate with their classmates um, and their teacher. So it's not like they can get on here. And the, the other part of this too is that the chats and all the pages are moderated. So if anything or anybody was to say anything inappropriate, it would be promptly taken down. So it's a safe place for uh, kids to learn on the internet about space uh, and, you know, history and historical figures and, and all that. So to me, if I, believe me, if I could donate <laughs> the, the, you know, the amount. So then that 1,250 will get 50 students. So we have, my goal is to get 45 more students uh, funded through this. So, uh, and as Topher mentioned earlier, this all goes straight to SLU. I'm not taking a cut of it. Um, Topher's not taking a cut yeah, of it. No. What's that? I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say I'm not taking it. If you if you happen to want to pay us directly to, to avoid any of the of the fees being taken out, a hundred percent of it will will be transparent and go right to SLU. Yep, absolutely. And I know that you know, and SLU, believe it or not, you know, even looking at this website here, they are a small company. Um, you know, there, there's still a very small staff of full time and an, and an even smaller one of part time. So uh, this is you know, not many people and anything. And, you know, and, and you don't have to donate 25 if you want to donate five or 10, you know, anything, anything helps, you know, so Absolutely. $12 yeah. is six months. <laughs> you know what First, I mean? Quick question yeah. for you. I belong to a rock and mineral club and we have a group called Pebble Pups. Now, is this something I could present to my club? to get members to also contribute to this, that 
the Pebble Pups of the Mineral Club could benefit from also, or do they have to be in a particular school? No, not at all. So if you wanted to reach out to them and, uh, and you can either get them in touch with me or I will get you uh, Russ Glenn's uh, contact info, uh, you can reach out to him. And, uh, you know, if you, you or somebody you knew or the club themselves uh, had a donation that they would like to either, you know, make or put those students or those kids in that club that you're mentioning specifically, um, you could absolutely do that. So... Well, a club Z board committee and I would like to present that to them because uh, I, I think that's fantastic work you're doing and it's so important to share the information and get them while they're young in hopes that they'll continue and go on and even make a career of it. Absolutely and I really really appreciate it. and just so I'm tracking I'm not uh, who's talking right now I'm sorry. Art Wagner. Art Wagner okay cool there we go. Um, yeah, so definitely if you have time either tonight or tomorrow, please reach out to me and I'll get you in touch with the people you need to get in touch with. Um, okay. and you know, I'd be more than happy as well to do either a presentation for you on your own and, you know, dive a little bit deeper into it or, mm -hmm. um, or if, you know, you just, you just want to jump right in or if you want to get more of a, more of an idea, but it's absolutely, and, and the prices wouldn't change. It's not going to be like, oh, Hey, you know, it's, it's $50 now. So you know, we're, we're currently running for, you know, students in schools, we can do $25 per student. So. Excellent. Excellent. If there's Thank any, you. uh, if there's any astronomy clubs that happen to be watching this or any, um, boy scout troops or any, any clubs or any church organizations, perhaps that are youth organizations. Um, if you have, uh, particular standout students that you think would be a shooting star in this program, um, and you don't really necessarily can offer to everyone. If there's just one or two people, you know, one or two kids, th this could be a life changing thing for them. Absolutely. It could, it could help someone really find uh, a passion and a life path uh, to better themselves, better understand the universe and, and, and all the good things we're, that we're talking about. So Chris, uh, I don't mean to cut you off, but I think you did a fantastic job, uh, and I and I'm really looking forward to those donations rolling in. Uh, the, I, like I said, the last hundred dollars is is on me. I I hope that I I hope I have to pony up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So um, we're going to be checking back in with you from time to time. Um, make sure everyone subscribes to your podcast. <clears throat> was there? I, I don't want to leave you hanging. So is there? Is there anything that that you want to make sure you get out um, about the organization, about yourself? Do you have any astro uh, photography pictures you can show us today? Not currently on this computer. Uh, I'm actually in the process of trying to recover a whole bunch of my images uh, on a hard drive that crashed recently. Oh. So, uh, yeah, well, something for us to look forward to. Have you yeah, rub back. rub the dirt Bad in that there a little bit there, yeah. bud. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, you're good. Um, no, so I, if you're okay with it, uh, five less than five more minutes. Uh, well, I would just yeah. like to go ahead and share, um, since you know, with the people here tonight, uh, a bit of a sneak peek of uh the program the powerpoint that, oh hey i just hit my microphone that was cool uh sorry about that so, can you edit that out <laughs> every edit takes me 10 minutes so no <laughs> perfect thank you you got a star on your ear oh that. no it's my piercing <laughs> it's like a cubic zirconia earring dude <laughs> no it's real it's stellar um, so I do, the, I do want to give a bit of a sneak peek actually to you guys. So uh, I know I mentioned earlier about the, uh, class or like the, the course I want to, uh, teach, um, to people about, um, about how to use weather radar for this. So this is just going to be one, let me see if it loads up. There we go. So this is just one image that we're looking at right now and, uh, don't pay attention to any of the stuff on the left because that's all the <laughs> secret. Um, so this is the most recent New York fall on December 2nd. So uh, these radar returns right here are only 7,800 feet off the ground. So 
Um, we'll be talking about how to uh, move your KMZ files into Google Earth from, and this is all going to be free, uh, free mm -hmm. software you can do. The course, I'm only asking $50 a person just because it's, it's been time consuming to create a 35, is it 32 or 35? 32 uh, slide PowerPoint and continuing to grow. Uh, and then obviously, you know, just my, <laughs> my knowledge, but uh, the programs here in this basic course are, um, are completely free. Um, you know, Google Earth Pro and then the NOAA Climate Toolkit. Um, but so this is just kind of something you'd be able to do. So what you're looking at right here is a uh, base reflectivity product and um, essentially where there could be meteorites on the ground. So um, these are not, and just for everybody who's watching tonight, uh, you know, this may look like a lot. Uh, unfortunately, most of these returns are between like negative two and negative five decibels. Um, so with that being said, I mean, this is, and this is in clear air mode. So normally this means, you know, items or um, hydrometeors. So hydrometeors meaning snow, rain, stuff like that um, are falling, but this is very, very light snow. So if, I mean- People are looking for pebbles, not boulders. Exactly. <laughs> and if there were, if there are, or were going to be some, uh, you know, just because they weren't caught on radar during the slice, they may be further down range. They may be further down from the flight path. So it came in like this. And if there are heavier ones, it could be over in this area that I didn't quite screenshot. But um, again, that's something that we'll, that we'll discuss in the course. So I just kind of want to show everybody a quick What's screen. the subject? What's the title of the course again, roughly? So the title of the course, I'll just do that. So using NextRad Weather Radar to aid in meteorite recovery. So... With that being said, and you know, and when we will cover the challenges of using radar for meteorite recovery, we will uh, go over um, just basic, uh, you know, radar analysis techniques. We'll go over a whole bunch of really, really cool items that, um, you know, that you really can't find anywhere else. Uh, there's not many people out there uh, that are willing to share this knowledge um, for, for whatever reason. Um, but many, I want to say probably before I was actually doing meteorology for the military, uh, Mark Fries was nice enough to share some of his, uh, some of his knowledge with me. So, um, I've just been able to build on that with what I've learned from, you know, my experience in doing meteorology, um, and, you know, just being on, being on the forecasting desk and, and working some long hours and staring at a lot of radar and, uh, satellite screens. <laughs> so, um, and we'll also go into different resources as well. Uh, you know, how you can use the, the uh, GOES lightning mapper, uh, the, sorry, geostationary lightning mapper, the GOES GLM, um, how to use, um, you know, the, the AMS page and stuff like that. So, you know, it's going to be, it, it's going to be, a, you know, a fairly, they call it a medium dive. You know, there's, there's really no such thing as a shallow dive when it comes to, uh, to weather radar inter and interpreting it. So, it won't just be going over irrigating it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It won't just be going over like base reflectivity. We're going to dive into, you know, correlation coefficient, specific differential reflectivity, um, or sorry, specific differential phase and then differential reflectivity, uh, a whole bunch of different products. So, and we'll show you how to figure out what you're looking at because, you know, not everything you see on radar is going to turn out to be a meteorite that's, that happens to be in the area. So, but That's all I've got. Determining a schooling field gives yep. you some idea. Exactly. I, I think that's fantastic. And one question I had is how long are those images saved from a Doppler radar that you can refer back to, or do they just obliterate them after a certain amount of time? Because there's such an amount of data they record, there's just not enough room to warehouse it. Nope, there's plenty of room to warehouse and you can actually access it online and it's all downloadable. So you can either pull that into the uh, weather climate toolkit, like I mentioned that we'll be using in this course. Um, and then for the people who want to dive even deeper and even potentially learn about the meteorology, I'm already toying with the idea of an advanced course. Uh, the only downside to that would be is that you're going to be paying for software at that point uh, for software like Gibson Ridge Level 2 Analyst. Uh, that's a $250 software. Um, but you're able to pull in the data and actually, um, 
like look at 3D snippets of the atmosphere uh, and what it looked like. So um, yeah, there's, and there are so many different things, but yeah, you can download, I think as far back as 1999 or so it's, it's a long time. So, you know, the last 21 years of, of, you know, radar data, you can download it. So, well, that's yeah. Great. Uh, um, I'll tell you what. So if you, if you want to, um, if you want to sign up for uh, Chris's class on, uh, on the radar, uh, reach out to him. His contact information is going to be below. If you want to donate to SLU, uh, the GoFundMe uh, official page will be listed and you can also reach out to, to Chris and I. Uh, Chris, thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, I know that you could have gone on for hours. I hope I, you don't feel sliced off. No, you're um, good, man. This is great. It was a good ending point. Awesome. Good deal. Yeah. And, and really the, the, the focus of today was to, to introduce you, to make sure the group knows who you are, know that you're qualified and capable uh, and that we're dedicated, we're dedicated to, uh, to the youth, trying to bring them up and give them tools and, you know, God, if we can just inspire and get not only just inspire, but give the tools needed and and make it enjoyable. The Xbox game experience, the rewards, the leveling up. Like I want to get to Galileo stage right now. <laughs> so, no. That'll take some time. <laughs> so no, uh, very, very. You're doing really good things, and I, I'm hoping that uh, that uh, we get a lot of donations to help uh, those 50 students right away. So thank you very much for joining, Chris. Really appreciate your time, man. Appreciate you having me on here tonight, Topher. It's yeah. been great. And uh, thanks to everybody else for having me and, uh, and bearing, bearing with, because I know, you know, astronomy is not necessarily the uh, topic of the night here. So I do appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. We, we love talking a little bit about everything. And I think right now we're going to switch into a little bit of show and tell mode. Nice. Uh, got Cameron. Oh, I know what Cameron has. I, I was oh, just, goodness. you know, hey. you know, it's still, you know, <laughs> living its good life in my case now nice dude so, i didn't even realize it. i saw you here and i was like i think that was him <laughs> yeah yeah um august of like 2018 Topher yeah. me a message was like hey by the way and so yeah i uh i appreciate <laughs> the chance to add to my my i call it my nerd cred section <laughs> <laughs> there you go man that's, that's great, awesome. dude. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice size one, too. Omaha I know. I was thinking the same thing. Have half, much mass. half gram, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, the only other thing I had was uh, I got a little piece of Taza from Ooh, Craig nice. Zleiman. I'd never seen the little star uh, Whitman statin pattern. Wow. But. Has a eight fifty nine. Oh, nice yeah. little. Yeah. That's cool. A little outside there. Oh, actually, I did have one other thing. Now I uh, know where the end went. Right, right. <laughs> uh, my son painted this. Uh, this is one of my favorite stories by H.P. Lovecraft. He wrote a story called "The Color Out of Space," and it's about a uh, a meteorite that hits a farm and it. It has uh, disastrous results, but he actually used black light reactive paint. Oh, oh Ooh, that's nice. Very cool. Dude. <laughs> very cool. So, <laughs> that's awesome. That awesome. Some of it actually glows in the dark, but you can't really can't really see. But that is anyway, phenomenal. Yeah. It's a very short story. You have to check it out. Yeah. See, that's what we're, we're we're trying to find those kids that have a. Uh, that have a love for astronomy, a love for space, who are creative people. That's pretty cool. That's nice. incredible. Thank you, baby. Uh, let me see here. I have some Moving stuff that I may be able to... Let me pause this. I'll help you out right. too, Chris. Oh. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, we, we paused for a second, and now everyone's chiming in. We're all talking about making donations of meteorites to SLU. So not only can the kids get access to the great programming and mentoring from SLU, but they can also get their hands on some meteorites, uh, just kind of to be cool. I so, like it. Very, yeah. very important, very yeah. important to have hands-on. 
Yeah. So Agreed. a bunch of us just came, just ponied up and said, we're going to start sending some, uh, start sending some space rocks over. So uh, talking about space rocks, we got uh, Mike Kelly wanting to show us something. Sweet. So as usual, it's little, but this is kind of a cool one. Um, so this is a piece of covert. Um, and what's neat about covert is this was kind of the piece that got Ninja going. So Ninninger saw a fireball and wanted to go uh, and collect it. Uh, he never actually found that piece, but in his kind of outreach program and his model, he went and speaking about, you know, doing, doing lectures and doing talks and getting kids into science. He mm -hmm. went out and, um, you know, was, was introducing people to meteorites and said, hey, if you ever find anything, get in touch with me. Um, so Covert was kind of the first piece that uh, they got, someone got back to him with, and it was like, a, it was a little kid. And said, hey, yeah, you know, I found this. And sure enough, it was a meteorite. Um, and that's kind of the piece that got Ninninger uh, believing that his methodology of, of outreach uh, to, to make a, a successful business model out of, out of being a full-time meteorite dealer came about. Hmm. Um, so that's always been a piece that's been on my list that I wanted to get just from its, uh, its uh, kind of historical value of, of being the one that, that proved to Ninninger that he could do uh, what he really wanted to do. He, he quit his university teaching job and became a full-time meteorite hunter, dealer, uh, you know, educational person, uh, and just focused on meteoritics. That's super cool. I like, see, and, th and that's one of the great things behind meteorites too is is the stories behind them because it, it's not necessarily just the rock. I mean, one of our little catchphrases is not just a rock. You know, there's so much behind it, and uh, and to have a piece like that um, is is pretty cool. Um, I have uh, no hands are up, so I have something I want to show off. These are my prototypes. These are not the final product. They'll be fully in uh, color when they're done. But this will soon be available for purchase. Nice. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I just proved that everything was sized correctly and will work. So you're going to have a full write-up on exactly what it is. This is the, uh, the CDF manifold. Um, it's a conf confined detonating de detonation uh, manifold. So basically the space shuttle, when it went up, the solid rocket boosters, once you lit them, you couldn't turn them off. So if the space shuttle went off trajectory or if there was a problem, uh, they could uh, send a self-destruct uh, signal to destroy the uh, SRBs. And this was actually flown on the space shuttle. They're allowed to fly twice before they're retired, the, uh, uh, the manifold with all the wires. So I have, I'd mocked up two of them and I asked my wife for her opinion. And let me see here. She said that you guys would rather not see a detail of the solid rocket booster, but you'd rather see that it was actually flown on the shuttle. So hopefully you guys agree with that. Hopefully this is of interest to you. We're talking about uh, space and astronomy and anything related to collecting. So this is something that I'm pretty happy to bring to market. On the side there, was that a copy of like the uh, NASA deaccessioning tag? Yeah, that's what this nice. is. Okay. So that's the decommissioning tag showing that it was actually flown on the space shuttle. It right. has the, the part number, the serial number. I, I have all the documentation to send to people, but uh, right here, I literally have the serial number and the, uh, and you know what? I have a small video. Let's go ahead and roll it. Yeah, so here, here's a little video I made. I'm gonna edit in the non-prototype when I'm done. points for anyone who recognizes the voice that I uh, dubbed in. Running vertically up the side of the rocket, you'll also see the electrical tunnel, which 
contains your cables and need to run the length of the booster to communicate between the Scott Manley. Here. There you go. But it will also find the explosives in the flight termination flight. Flight. runs down <laughs> the side. If you're going to terminate the flight of the booster, then the charge splits the thing along its length. And that, of course, stops the thing flying as a single mass and reduces the combustion. Of course, one time this uh, flight termination system was actually used was on Challenger after the breakup of the stack. The two boosters kept on going under their own power and had to be destroyed in case they went somewhere or they shouldn't. This is the same information that's going to be on in the uh, each kit. diagram right here is so cool because it shows you all the way from the command antenna all the way through the dual redundant system that leads out to the right and left solid rocket booster. This is the con uh, confined detonation um, right here. And this is the cord that we're looking at. It goes outside the hull to the linear shaped charge. And that linear shaped charge is the destruct assembly for the SRB. So I, I, that's something I've been wanting to get into for a, a while. Uh, I've, uh, I've enjoyed uh, the dream of owning part of the space shuttle. For, I've, I've, I've dreamt about that for a long time. So I actually have a piece now, a couple pieces. Um, so that will be available um, for purchase soon. But um, this is not a sales pitch or a sales show. We're doing good things here. Um, I'll take one. I'm very happy to announce. Now, we're not even talking sales. I want to focus on important stuff. Two students have been paid for as of right now. I just received a donation of $50 from one of our members online right now, and two students will be enrolled in the SLU program. Thank you very much. We definitely appreciate it. And That's on awesome. that Thank note... Yep, Chris. I told you, man. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're we're starting the knowledge bolide. <laughs> yeah, I like it. <laughs> Pat Brown, do you have something you want to show us, buddy? I do actually. Um, so I've got three books in my continuing uh, uh, stream of books to show. So this is the very first. Uh, book on meteorites written for the educated layperson. So it's uh, Our Stone Pelted Planet, Meininger. Oh, well, that's a good one. 1933. I don't have, mine doesn't have a dust cover, but like almost every copy of no. this book, uh, it's signed. Mm. These, it's actually. Uh, less common to find a copy of this that isn't signed really wow yeah huh. so 1933 uh same year as uh the meteoritical society started and uh neininger had uh had a hand in that too and one of the reasons that that we have this great um 
history of connection between the scientific community and the uh, hardcore amateur uh, meteoritics uh, community is uh, is all due to nine air. Then I've got two other extremely rare nine air books to show. This is a uh, oh, study well, of shapes. So all the external features? Yeah, and uh, it's all in black and white, but it shows various uh, various shapes of, of meteorites. Um, this uh, book came out in, uh, I believe it's 79, 77. Um, by Arizona State University Center for Meteorite Studies. Um, it's got the horrible old fashioned glued together binding. So if you <laughs> open it very far, it goes oh. pop. Oh no. Pages start falling out. And then years later in 1981, the second volume was published and this one's about orientation. Oh wow. I wonder if Marco has that. <laughs> <laughs> This is really quite a rare uh, pair of books. They're uh, the last ones that I saw go up for sale were uh, went for uh, four hundred bucks for the pair of them, which is a lot of money for for paperback books. But there's yeah. a there's a very oriented nose cone. Wow, that actually looks book. like uh, that that one by your finger in the corner looks like Barnstable. Oh. No, no, no. In the, in the bottom corner. Okay, we're, down here, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Barnstable <laughs> is, uh, is definitely an oriented meteorite. Yeah. Yep. So, um, if you are ever in a used bookstore and find uh, any of these for, uh, for less than about $200 a piece, that's a, that's a good, uh, good find, provided the bindings aren't destroyed. And, uh, the, these two are pristine, but it's very common to see the uh, the binding destroyed. Back to you, Topher. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I have something I want to show you guys, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. I want to see if the group can tell me. First off, is it a meteorite? Well, let me get better lighting. And if so, what type of meteorite? Is it a eucharite? Looks like a sugar type. Uh, there's one reflective surface in the middle there. That's usually not a good sign. Uh, and uh, just from the center upright, there's a, a, a cubic looking sort of crystal. Although yeah, there's small in grains. I'm loving this, by the way. Um, yeah, if you spin back over to that surface, uh, upper right, there's a protruding um, crystal that has sort of a cubic this right here? shape. No, it's uh, further up. It's right here. Oh, right there. Yep. Yeah. So right there. Yeah, so if that one was on meteorite or meteor wrong, uh, I would say that it doesn't look like a meteorite because of the mm -hmm. because of those crystals. Okay, but well, I always love to be wrong. All right. Well, I'm loving this because part of uh, part of what we do here is education. Mm -hmm. This is 100% terrestrial material. It is a peridot bomb from Morocco that has been meticulously cleaned to show you all the crap that you just saw. <laughs> yeah. Good call, Pat. Yeah, those yep. are... Very, very good. Those are commonly uh, uh, confused with meteorites. The uh, That one doesn't show any of the black surface, but the bombs as they're launched out of the uh, erupting uh, volcano have a black coating on them that superficially looks like fusion crust. Um, and I actually got fooled at Tucson one time many years ago 
somebody took one of those olivine bombs that had a flat sort of surface, chipped away the black uh, uh, outer coating from all the other surfaces, and uh, ran it around in the dirt to get it nice and dirty. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I bought it as a uh, as an unknown and uh, turned out to be a meteor wrong. So everybody's everybody's got one of those in their collection. And just like uh, the people that I learned fly fishing from said, if you're not losing flies in the trees once in a while, you're not fishing hard enough. <laughs> and if you don't come up with a, uh, if you don't have a few meteor wrongs that you've yeah. paid good money for, uh, you're not working the edges of the possibles hard enough. I actually bought this as a olivine bomb because I wanted to clean it up because I thought, you know what? If I could slice that down the middle and polish it up, oh, that would be beautiful. Oh, that would be cool. Mm -hmm. So um, always want to be uh, new and late breaking meteorite news. So what you're looking at here is going to be something newsworthy. You'll look at these and you'll notice that, well, first off, you cannot identify them based on, on just looking at them. I mean, it's, it's obvious. Um, <laughs> you just got to look at enough of them. To oh, then what is it? <laughs> no. Um, so if you look at these, you'll notice that there's obviously one bigger one than the other one. This one right here is bigger. This one is smaller but they both weigh the exact amount. They're both 60, oh, 61 grams, hmm. which means one is denser than the other. So if you look at this, the bigger one, it really doesn't have that much of a magnetic draw. But if you go to this smaller one, it has a much higher magnetic draw on it. So, the, the, I can't be too specific because we only deal in science and this, it hasn't been published yet. But what you're looking at is the first occurrence of a winonite that was found in this, a, a, the, the same winonite fall has both high metal and low metal for mm. the first time. We know these are from the same fall, meaning that there's not two strewn fields of winonites overlapping, because that's a possibility. It's a very rare possibility, because winonites are extremely rare. So to have two similar-looking winonites in the same strewn field, having them overlap is next to impossible. So we did isogen oxygen isotope testing to prove the cosmic age of the rocks are identical. They are from the same fall. These will soon be classified. I'm partnering with four other people. These will soon be classified and um, put on the Met Bowl. This is an example of what the high metal winonite looks like mm -hmm. from one of my partners, Sean Mahoney at Outer Spacer. Um, so we're actually doing a, a lot of, a lot more science on this classification than a lot of other classifications because we wanted to prove that they're from the same fall mm -hmm. and for the first time, high metal and low metal uh, are combined. And the reason that's kind of important is, and, uh, I know that there's more intelligent people in the group who will correct me, but when Onites, uh, border, the, the next transition would be to an iron in the IIABs or something like that. So if there is ever a meteorite found that was a Winonite and an iron IIA mixed together or transitioning, mm -hmm. that would prove the link. Mm -hmm. This may be I don't want to say this may be that rock, but there, there's a lot of uh, interest in this and it will be classified soon. It will be classified uh, first as a 
uh, as the, I think the only uh, Winonite anomalous. And after the paper is written by the classifier who uh, unfortunately won't be able to do that for six months. Once that paper is written, it'll probably be reclassed as a brand new transitional meteorite. And that's as much detail as I can say. Is this one related, Topher, to um, the one that um, Racine Samala has? No. Uh, okay. No, his is beautiful. Um, I know the one you're talking about, it's beautiful. It's, uh, yeah, it's spectacular. His is Algerian, uh, ours is Moroccan. Okay. So no, definitely different. But I like what you have on your screen right there. Yeah, so following up on uh, olivine bombs. Um, wow, it's not in focus. This one, this isn't a fool me one. I actually bought this one as an olivine bomb. Um, but it is, uh, it's been cut in half. And this one has a particularly thick uh, mm -hmm. outer coating on it. You can see how thick that rim is. And this one doesn't... You know, it doesn't really look like fusion crust. Mm -hmm. Someday I'm going to get a better camera for close-ups on rocks. But um, you, know, you can see this is, you know, it looks much more like a piece of, of lava than, uh, than anything. But uh, the interior is uh, olivine crystals. And very commonly, uh, these olivine bombs have two different colors of green in the crystals. Uh, I'm not certain, but, you know, one is certainly olivine. The other one appears to be uh, that the uh, chrome diopsite uh, mm -hmm. sort of color. I don't know that that's, I don't know that that's what it is. Um, I know that you're, you're experienced. Did you cut that one? No, I didn't. Actually, I bought this one cut and, uh, and polished, and it was, I got it from, um, Gary Fujihara, it was surprisingly oh, yeah. expensive. Yeah. Uh, this one is from uh, Mount Shadwell, Moore Lake, Victoria, in Australia. Yeah. Um, Gary Fujihara had some amazing um, ones available about a year and a half ago. Yeah. If you cut them thin enough, they really look like 7831. Uh. <laughs> really? Uh -huh. you, you can get them thin enough that they'll be translucent. Uh, well, I'll, I'll have some new uh, 7831 slices available soon. It <laughs> 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 was uh, one of the projects I was looking at doing was having that in the display with 7831, you know, kind of a which one's the meteorite. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, it's, it's peridot. It, it's created under intense heat and pressure. I mean, it's the same exact basic stuff from space is just created under terrestrial conditions so it's very easy to get fooled uh unless you are you know trained geologist or meteoriticist or just you know uh, taking an, enough look at things to, to know what you're looking at yeah the uh, you know the, the one of the difficulties on is it a meteorite and meteorite or meteorong is that um uh, the same igneous processes that happened on uh, meteorite planet, planetary bodies and Mars and the moon and so forth, those same igneous processes uh, happened here on Earth as well. And uh, so, so many of the, of the rocks that show up on meteorite or meteorong are obviously igneous and totally lack fusion crust. And uh, so... I had been saying are not meteorites, but uh, now on some of the better looking ones, I'll say, well, you know, the same processes happen and the odds of yours being uh, a meteorite are astronomically low, pun intended. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, and here's another one. This actually uh, is really brightly colored. Nice. Which I thought was really unique. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to show these off because we're talking about collecting, you know, um, materials from space on Earth for a while. Well, this is materials from Earth that's been on Earth for a while, but used by humans, tran transformed, but still in its, you know, 
in its form. I thought that was really cool. So thanks, thanks a lot, Sam. I appreciate that. Oh yeah. This was also included in it, and I think we're looking for a little bit of help in identifying it. So maybe we can get some opinions. It seems to have a like tectite type glass feel to it. If that was also recovered from Arizona, I mean, I don't know if this was in one of those fields, but I know there's a lot of uh, ancient lava flows that will leave rocks that look similar to that. Yeah, the so I, I'm not picking up the 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 scheme that that's used for uh, um, compression on photos on on uh, Zoom is is. Uh, difficult but i'm not picking up on any real glassy sort of look if you do find glass that's it's either a tectite or it's a meteoron um it, it has the feeling especially like right here it definitely has the feeling of yeah. uh, of a of a tectite because the clasps are angular yeah i think that's probably a wrong but if you want to uh, post or send some uh, high res pictures, I'd be happy to. Yeah, because I'd like to I'd like to get help identifying exactly what the heck it is, because I don't know. <laughs> so that that's part of the uh, part of the games we play, uh, and part of part of the part of what we do is just trying to identify things, even when we have them in our hands. Sometimes we can't identify them. But I know what those pottery shards are for sure. So that was that was. I was going to say cool nearest nearest thing on tectites is uh, College Station in Texas for badiasites. They really you got them, and you got Georgiites in the in North America. I think mm -hmm. that's the only two you got. So very small areas. They look a lot different. Yeah. Does anyone? have something they'd like to show off or get off their chest or can confess to. <laughs> I love you guys. Nice. Well, Oz, uh, we love there, you. I got and, it off my chest. And we're super glad you're with us today, man. Absolutely. This is a little 70 gram one that I got just a couple days ago. I just really, it has so much, so much going on. That I thought was interesting enough to pick up. I really wonder what it looks like on the inside. I might have to cut this puppy open. Does it look like a low petrological to you or not? I'm not seeing anything that looks like a chondrule yet. Although again, that that the the. the yeah, the you're, you're video compression the they they use is really weird. It makes everything look yeah. triangular. I don't know. There was there was something about this one that just yeah. caught my attention. And it's it's really magnetic. Yeah, if you got the fire so, uh, the saw fired up, I definitely cut a corner off that one. Yeah, it's it's in the uh, exactly. it's in the heavy L class probably, but I just absolutely love. A weathered meteorite with the metal sticking out and some of the silicates uh, worn away. It it just I don't know. To me, yeah, you, you know, fresh crust is great, but if it's going to be old, I might as well ha might as well have some character worn into it, like us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, gotta have that raw look. Yeah, yeah. All right, let me pause for one second. Sweet. We got Sam Lopez checking in for the second week in a row. Sam, how are you, buddy? I'm hiding outside. My wife isn't feeling well, so she said, get out of the room. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, we're glad you're feeling good enough to join us. Good, good, good. Well, I had a couple things to show um, concerning impact tights. You know, I was just curious. Let me flip the camera. Of course, we know fulgurites. Mm -hmm. You know, they, I think it's called Le Chatelierite that it forms, you know, you can find them. They're, they're fairly common, actually, despite what people say. And then 
we have, I think, what we they call um, suavite. I, from what I've heard, you know, where it has the impact melt, and you can see the, uh, not on the camera, the glass will run through. I don't know. There's there's several more, you know, real glassy. These were all found within the area that I had mentioned previously. Yeah, cool. Um, when fulgurites um, are not always just the tube of sand. Um, I actually dug one out on a dry lake bed that started out as a uh, little mesquite bush, and uh, uh, the mesquite bush was was gone and the fulgurite was actually conically shaped with a blob of glass running out of the bottom of it. So the the broken pieces you have there could easily be uh, fulgurite, uh, but just different non-typical shapes. That's cool. Yeah. And there's also um, the, the main mass that I well, suspected, we're not quite sure yet, main mass um, I have it right here actually it's not the main mass but below it is actually the looks like Le Chatelierite yeah so the the I, I'm not certain how to pronounce that one that is a high pressure uh, phase of quartz that um, you pretty much if, if you can prove that it's there that pretty much proves that you've got enough gigapascals to to claim impact uh, it creates uh coasite right or schistovite one of the two yeah coasite and schistovite are also other um uh high pressure pseudomorphs of quartz uh that again uh you, know, you have to have several gigapascals of, of pressure wave to uh, to form, and they're and it, great indicators it, of impact. And it doesn't, there's no known, besides a nuclear bomb, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, and it's, there's the soil right there. You can still see some soil on it that's gotten. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, that's interesting. So Yeah, this, um, was, this was under that the main mass that I had picked up, the supposed hmm. main mass. Okay. I, I at first thought it was concrete. I left it in a bin, didn't really think much of it. And then I started looking at it again. I'm like, wait a minute, that looks exactly like a fulgurite. Yeah, could it could be an impact height. Um, the, uh, I, I don't know of ways to identify uh, the high pressure uh, pseudomorphs of quartz other than making a thin section and uh, looking at the refractive index of it. It's but, extremely dense, that's for sure. It, the thing is heavy for, it doesn't look heavy, but it is. Mm -hmm. Well, and if you go to the backside of it again too, like you said, it looks like you have that layer up at the top and then you have like the main, like the actual soil beneath it, which is. Like different it, densities. Really yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah, and of course, impactites are uh, terrestrial material that's have, mm -hmm. that have been uh, shocked into um, uh, a breccia, right. just like the, you know the lunar, um, you know, eleven two seventy three, and and all the other similar ones are are uh, uh, impact breccias where uh, a an ordinary meteorite hit hard enough to compress the soil into a rock. So impactites are essentially that same thing. Okay, okay. Are you, <clears throat> excuse me. You mentioned that that came out from underneath the main mass. Do you have yeah, the, so do you have the main mass? Not on me. I mean not at my house. I don't, <laughs> I don't keep it here. But excuse it me. is it is compressed, so it wasn't very, I don't know how to explain it. You know, I'm all new to this, and it, mm -hmm. it basically taught me as I was learning. And it's, it's, I guess, gravitationally compressed because it was, I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll look forward to, you said that you have a scientist looking at it right now, correct? Yeah. Yeah. 
Good. Well, like I said, keep keep checking in with us week after week, man. We'll take this ride with you, okay? All right. I mean, I'll tell it's, it's weird. People, they, I get sent so many pictures and so many requests, and I hate saying no 99.999% of the time, but the truth is 99.999% of the time, the answer is no. Right. We want to say yes <laughs> we want to go oh wait a second send, send me another picture you know <laughs> we want to have someone stumble across a 16 kilogram piece you know what i mean it we're not trying to control the market and and limit the amount of meteorites available because trust me we're not that powerful the, the the world is too big for us uh but we are in, in people's corners, the people who go out there, who know what they're looking for, who spend the time, who don't, uh, you know, bring obvious quartz crystals to us. But we're <laughs> rooting for you guys. You know, we, we want new discoveries. It's in the best interest of science, the best interest of meteoritics. More data is, is always better. So, yeah, I, I just want to speak for everyone on the meteorite or meteor wrongs or, or anyone who who comments and helps people push people in the right direction. Um, we're we're never we're we're on your side as as long as you as long as you listen to science, we're on your side. We we would love to say yes, that is a very rare meteorite, or yes, it is a very it is a meteorite, you know. Um, but as you can see, sometimes you get the stuff in your hands and you still can't tell what it is, and and that's why you know things like this. I would normally would not buy or be interested in spending seventeen hundred dollars for two little rocks. Mm -hmm. But knowing what they are, you know, makes all the difference. And the only way we know is from science. Yep. So, yeah, there are, there are no uh, uh, ulterior motives there. Uh, I I'm the main admin on Meteorite or Meteorong, and one of the main contributors on Is It a Meteorite? And I get accused all the time of mm -hmm. of uh, you know, claiming that they're not meteorites because I want to corner the market or something. Well, I've got a lot of meteorites, but I'm not cornering any market. And I'm not a dealer. I don't sell. I only buy. So we... And uh, that, that's key because, like like Pat said, he is... He's, you see that when I showed the, the Peridot bomb, uh, Pat hadn't seen it before. Um, I didn't clue him in. I let everyone see it the same. I didn't lead anyone... Um, he picked out a few things. I mean, he was spot on. Um, obviously, he wasn't like, it's 100% terrestrial. There's always room, wiggle room, because we don't see it. We don't <laughs> hold it. We can't feel it. We can't, you know, we can't give it our, our lick test, <laughs> you know. So there, there is some wiggle room in there, but it's quite annoying when people try to argue with us and then they pull out the whole, you're trying to control the, the, the supply of meteorites. <laughs> Trust me. I'm not, I'm, I'm a small little, I'm, I'm a, I'm the burnt French fry in the bottom of your McDonald's bag. <laughs> <laughs> and so, on the, so, so Pat doesn't sell. So only worry about it on the media wrong side. If he tells you it's a media wrong and send it to his house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. I don't, yeah, I, I don't do that. And uh, the other, the other point there, and I, Topher uh, alluded to it, but I'll make it more upright. Um, you know, I love to be wrong. Those are the moments in which you learn. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, I'm, I'm still holding on to this one from, uh, I think I showed it off last week. I actually had a Moroccan send it to me. Um, so I still have that, but I, I don't know what it is and it's going to go to a lab, you know? So there, there's a lot that, uh, that, you know, science can only tell. What All right, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining us. We're, we're out of uh, two hours today, so we're going to call it quits. We could probably go on all night talking nerd stuff and astronomy and space. I would uh, encourage everyone to please go to the link down below for SLU and donate. Let's get some more kids' uh, dreams of astronomy realized. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your par participation today. We all learned a little. We laughed a little. And I had a little tear. Good night, everyone. Have a nice night. Good night, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Good night. Thanks, Good night. Thanks, Chris, for joining us, too. I really appreciate it. Bye, guys. Good seeing everybody.